Okay. So, Leanne, are you ready to go? Uh, this is where I'm going to ask Leanne to put her camera on and put her microphone on, and everything is going to work so smoothly. This it is perfectly. So, let's get block two underway. So, our first speaker in this block is Leanne Atherton. She's a qualified special education teacher with experience in teaching of both, uh, sorry, with experience of teaching both in the UK and internationally. She completed her PGCE PCET in further education at the City of Bath College and currently teaches learners with profound and multiple learning difficulties at a special school in Oxfordshire. She holds a TEFL qualification and has ELT experience teaching young learners in Thailand and Aboriginal students in Australia. She's recently completed a master's in education in special educational needs and disability, where she explored the transition from school to further education for girls with autism. Naturally, then she's joining us today to uh, talk about uh, an area oh, that is close to her qualifications and research. So, Lillian, over to you. Good luck. Enjoy the talk. And I am here if you need me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sean. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to see you all joining in the chat box. It looks like there are lots of people joining from all over the world, which is lovely. And the best thing about LTOX, it feels like I'm traveling already. Um, I hope you're all okay and relaxed. Hopefully we can have an, a bit of an interactive session. And if you have got any questions, as Sean said, please pop them in the chat box and I will answer them at the end of the talk. Do let me know where you're joining from. I can see lots of hellos, highs, good evening from Prague, from Czech Republic, Prague, from Poland. Lovely, all over the world, brilliant. And I hope everybody's got a nice cup of tea or coffee. I have got my tea and I'm ready. Uh, for our session. So I thought I would, uh, Sean did a lovely introduction, but I thought I would just add to that to say um, that I have recently started working at a special school and it's been an amazing experience and I've learned a huge amount over the last year or two. Um, so these things that I've picked up along the way, I'm going to share with you today and hopefully combine my ELT experience with my uh, experience in the UK and we'll have, have some fun as we go. So let's get started, shall we? Um, welcome to teaching SEND learners, and that's learners with special educational needs and disabilities in the English language classroom. Um, one size doesn't fit all, and this will be a key thing that we, we come back to through the talk. And as I said, lots of tips and tricks to support learners online. I can still see lots of people joining. Hello from Turkey. Hi, Russia. Peru. Brilliant. Right, so let's have a little look at the session overview. We are going to start with a bit of an interactive uh, discussion around inclusion and what that might mean to us, followed by a little bit about online learning and how we can adapt that for our SEN learners. Uh, Multi-sensory and multimodal learning. Then we're going to have a little look at lots of different types of communication. And I know um, this has been a bit of a hot topic for us at the school that I'm in at the moment. So I've got lots of stuff to share with you on that. Um, something that we all want to know how to do and, and do often is uh, adapting our teaching materials. And again, how can we adapt those to, to help and support with our SEN learners? And then lastly, we're going to have a little look at developing learner autonomy and learner agency. So it's definitely going to be a very busy session and it's so lovely to see so many of you here. So let's get started, shall we? Inclusive practices. So it might mean different things depending on context. And there's lots of teachers that teach all over the world in different classrooms in different ages and, and levels. But I want you to have a little think about inclusion and what does that mean to you? You are going to see some options on the screen it will either be A, B, C or D. And what I'd like you to do, and I think the chat box might go off a little bit is answer which one you agree with with regards to inclusion. So, A, do you think inclusion means developing strategies that meet everybody's need and that support quality, quality learning and particip participation for all? So everybody is included. B, engagement of the school community in supporting learners' processes for every student. What about C, attending to differences and diversity and supporting students to learn in their own way, in their own individual way. And lastly, D, constantly evaluating and refining systems and outcomes to accommodate for all learners. So let me know what you think. Is it A, B, C or D? 
I know lots of people are still saying hello. Ah, oh, we've got some letters coming through now. I can see that. Lots of C's. Okay. So really thinking about those differences. And I'm sure as teachers, we know that all of our students have lots of differences, but it's really honing in on those and, and making sure that we're catering for that. Brilliant. Lots of C's. That's really interesting. A few A's. I think I'm seeing a couple of D's. Great. Thank you so much for all your interaction on that. I'm going to let you keep going for a minute while everybody has a chance to answer. Ah, okay. We have a few people I've noticed have said all of them. I think you might be right, and it's a little bit of a trick question to start us off with. I think it is all four of those things, plus many, many more, and we're going to explore those in, in this chat. But it's lovely to see lots of you commenting and, and saying all of them, because I think we have to make sure that all of our students are really included in all of our lessons. So inclusion is tricky, but we are teachers and we like a challenge, don't we? I think that's the reason why lots of us go into teaching. It's always challenging. Um, so just a few things to pick out that I think that inclusion and what inclusion means and why it's so important. I think it's that including everyone. And I know that's really tricky to master, but making sure that everybody is included, whatever level and whatever ability that they might be. Uh, removing barriers to learning. So taking away things or, or helping students to, to break down those barriers that might be stopping them from learning. And again, there's so many different things that, that, that can stop students or hinder their learning. So I think it's, it's down to the teacher to figure out what those barriers might be. Um, valuing learner diversity, and that was really interesting because lots of you were saying that C answer, which had that focus on celebrating diversity. And there's a lovely quote here as well from Mari Delaney about inclusive practices and how they acknowledge that everybody has different strengths and that diversity should be celebrated. And I think we are good at doing that, celebrating all the different uh, students that we have in our classes. Um, I think we need to make sure that we're supporting all learners, but I think the most important one for me is this last one, which is participation for all. Because I think we can sometimes set lessons up and give activities and tasks and think that everybody is participating and joining in, but actually it might not be at the right level or it might not be accessible for them. So I think that it's really key to get that, that participation from all students. Brilliant. Okay, so I wanted to have a little look at the two level approach to inclusion. And I think this is really kind of split into those two parts. So you've got the general level, which is that teachers need an understanding of the common difficulties that they face, that SEM learners face in, in the classroom. And I think that you just learn that as you go through research, through discussing with your learners and getting to know, to know them. I think there's lots of reasons why students might struggle. On the other hand, we've got our individual level, and this is really student centered. This is really about the student. So the teacher needs to work with each learner to identify those barriers, like I've just said. So once they kind of get to know what those barriers might be, then they can alter perhaps how they're, they're teaching the lessons or, or make activities more accessible. And I think once teachers grasp both the general and the individual, then they can create an environment that's accessible for, for everybody. Um, it, I know it takes time and it's just putting that time aside to really get to know those students. And lots of you, I'm sure, have many, many students in your class. Um, so it's tricky, but I think both of those levels together are how we're going to put interventions in place and support our learners to, to get the most out of our lessons, which is what we want really, isn't it, at the end of the day. Brilliant. So this was part of my uh, talk byline, and that was that one size doesn't fit all. So everything that I'm going to suggest today, and I've got lots of practical tips and ideas and activities and tasks, they're not going to work for every single one of your students. And I think that's why it's so important to get to know their personalities, their abilities, their learning styles, what helps them to to learn and also I think getting that that background of what's going on outside of school as well which can then affect the way that they are learning and again this depends on what age you're you're dealing with but I think there's definitely ways to to learn um, how best to support those learners 
Right, okay, it is time for a little poll. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Roughly, how many young children worldwide are affected by biological, environmental and psychological conditions that can limit their cognitive development? And I've got three answers for this one. So we've got A, 100 million, B, 500 million, or C, 800 million. So I'm gonna give you a little chance again to pop your letter in the chat box so I can see whether you think it's 100, 500, and, or 800. And then I'm gonna have a little look at what your responses are. So if you click on Polian, you'll be able to see it. Brilliant. So, Sean, I can only see the climate change poll, would it show me? So, uh, so can you um, see the word open when you're on polls? Do you see the word open at the top? Yeah. Click on open. Ah, brilliant. Got it. Fab. Go. Thank no you. Right. I can see some answers coming through. So we've got quite a few I'm thinking in the middle, the sort of 500 million. I'll give you a few more minutes to answer that. Big numbers, aren't they? Yeah, we've got. So it seems like most people are leaning towards that middle middle amount of five hundred million. Um, in actual fact, it is eight hundred million, which I thought it was going to be a, a huge amount, but that yeah, that really is a big number, isn't it? So we can never really understand every single condition, but I think that there needs to be a lot of research done. To, to, to figure out how we, we do support our learners um, that may struggle um, um, or may have these things that would impact their learning. Um, I think there are 15 million learners in Europe alone with SEN um, with those additional needs. So it's huge, huge numbers. Um, and I think it's something that we just, yeah, we need, we need to understand and try to, to get to know better so that we can support, support our learners. Great. Okay, let's have a little look at online learning. So, I know it's tricky. Um, we've all had to adapt as well, haven't we, over the last few years with everything that's happened, and we've moved a little bit more towards online learning. Um, I think there are lots of positives and lots of great things about online learning and the online world. LTOC, for example, is one of the great things that we're able to do. Um, but I do think in the back of my mind, since starting at the, the special school, it's what things do we need to consider when we're online for our SEN learners? Um, so I am a big fan of visuals. I, you will hear me saying this a lot through this talk. Visuals, visuals, visuals. I like to use pictures, images, symbols, photographs. And I don't think sometimes that we make the most of that in our ELT classroom. Um, and sounds, obviously. Um, so visuals along with sounds are just really crucial and, and you can do so much with them. Um, keep it as simple as you can. Obviously, you can tailor it to each learner and make it more complicated if you need to, um, but do try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, don't be af afraid to repeat things and repeat and repeat and, and keep trying. Um, don't be afraid to experiment. I'm sure you're all great at experimenting. Here we go. I love experimenting in this field of research. There's so many things that you can experiment with. Sometimes it, it's just taking that step, isn't it? And being confident enough to experiment with those. And I think actually having those discussions with your learners that, yeah, maybe sometimes things don't quite work out, but we can adapt and we can change and we can work through that. Um, and this one's really important to me as well. And again, I think it's something that I've picked up since working at school is just giving students choices. A lot of the time we will make the decisions without probably even realizing and give students certain things but i think it's really nice to be able to let them choose um, and again i'm going to talk about that a little bit with, with learner agency but those are just some of the key things that i thought around um, learning online for sem learners um, the other thing that i've kind of put into that thought bubble because again it's quite key for me is uh giving students the opportunity to feed back um, on on the learning and how that's going and if there's anything that they would appreciate you as the teacher doing. 
um, and support them to do this if necessary. And when I was thinking about this, a kind of student of mine um, popped into my head um, and he's got his own iPad set up with a voice activated app. So he's able to communicate with myself and my team. I've luckily got quite a big team um, and he is able to make those choices through symbols and through an, uh, an app um, with, with that voice. So it's really lovely um, for him to be able to give us feedback on what he's enjoying and what he isn't. Um, brilliant. Okay, so speaking of technology, there are a huge amount of uh, tools available, aren't there? And I think sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming. You're going to see some, I'm not going to read them all out on the screen, but you're going to see some um, appear and you will probably recognize quite a lot of them as I did. Um, but there's so many different things out there. Um, if there's any that you recognize um, or you don't recognize, maybe have a little look after the talk and do some investigating about how you might be able to incorporate them into your lesson. But the reason I'm showing these is because I definitely think that we need to consider what we're using with our SEM learners. And some of these questions, when you're using your technology, maybe just have a think. Um, do they meet a need? Is, there, is it necessary for us to be using this? And what is the need for this, this technology or this tool? Is it going to be suitable for my learners? Um, and again, I think you, as you get to know your class across the year, that's how you will get to know whether, whether it's suitable or not. Um, be consistent. I know it's tricky to do that at times, but be consistent. Be co as consistent as you can when you try something and trial that for a few months. I think it takes time sometimes to get these things in place. Um, this is a really key one as well, making sure that you're onboarding your students. And that could be in a variety of different ways. It might be that um, for some instructions, written down works quite well. Others might need symbols or visuals, or perhaps you could put a little video demo together. Um, but it's really important to communicate that with your students and to onboard them. And the last one is just allow time. I think just allow time for, for anything that you put into place um, and, and keep consistent with that. Brilliant. OK, so multisensory and multimodal learning. What are they all about? So multisensory learning is obviously a little bit easier when you're in the class and you're face to face because you can do the things and use the resources where you're touching, smelling, feeling and working in a special school where we have learners with profound and multiple learning difficulties. This is kind of part of my day to day. We do a lot of this um, to get students exploring and picking things up and and just using those resources. Um, so I think the, the key ones I would say for ELT are definitely sight, hearing and touch. And if you can try to recreate some of those in the online environment, I think that really helps those SEN learners to understand what it is they're, they're learning. Um, so yeah, replicating that online can be tricky, but I think there are lots of things that you can do. And I'm going to hint at some of those a little bit further along our talk. Um, multimodal, on the other hand, is essentially making the most of all of the interactive digital act, um, media that we have available. And there is so much out there, isn't it? It might be our integrated video, we can see on, on the screen now, our interactive whiteboard materials, or perhaps apps. I wonder how many of you use apps with your uh, brilliant some comments coming through visual, auditory and tactile, definitely. Um, yeah, so apps like, um, for example, Quizlet or something like that, that really allow students to practice that vocab. So I think it's really utilizing all of the media that's out there um, and just um, and experimenting with that and, and just making sure that it's access accessible for the learners. Yeah, lots of people coming through. Oh yeah, learning platforms, Moodle, Brilliant, Padlet, Quizlet, Kahoot. Oh, Kahoot's a good one. Definitely use that a lot with, with past students, actually. Um, but yeah, there's so much out there. Um, it's just making sure that it's going to work for all of our learners. And I think the only way you can know that is, is to, to practice with them and, and get them using it. 
Okay, this is quite an interesting one and something that I have learned so much on in the last couple of years. Um, there are so many different ways that you can communicate with your learners and I'm going to get you to have a little think. So have a little think about the different ways that you communicate with your learners. Is it one way, two ways, three, four? And I want you to write the number in the chat box so I can see how many different ways you might communicate with your learners. And I'm going to share some of the ways that we do it at my school. I've got lots of lovely comments coming through about the different apps and stuff that everybody uses. Brilliant. Okay, I've got three, four, five, <laughs> many, yeah, lots of different ways. Brilliant. I can see, yeah, five, four, ten. That's a big number. Lots of different ways. I'm trying to think of my current setting now. So we've got speech which is obviously key for English language teaching. We have pod books and Makaton, which are a couple of things I'm going to talk about more in a minute. Um, software apps like the one I talked about, the iPad. And I think the same as you, there's so many more uh, different ways that we communicate with our, our learners. Thank you for being so interactive in the chat box. So um, alternative or augmented communication. And we love all the acronyms, don't we? The ELT, SEN, this is AAC. Um, they're essentially just different methods to support and aid communication. Um, so they might be devices, systems, strategies, different tools um, that just help to support learners' natural speech. Um, and I think they're really, really important because they can maximize learners' communication skills. And especially in ELT, that's, that's what we want, isn't it? We want our learners to be able to go out and communicate confidently um, in English. So I think they're really important. Um, I wonder if you could chat uh, right in the chat box, yes or no, if you've heard of Makaton before. Because up until a few years ago, I didn't know much about Makaton and it is now a big part of my day to day. Ah, interesting. Got for, yeah. Based Brilliant. Yeah, no, no. Okay, we're getting quite a few no's through. Interesting. And I think I had experience in English language teaching. And this is more kind of focused on the, those SEN learners. But I think it would be hugely beneficial in the English language um, classrooms. So that's why I'm sharing it with you today. Interesting. Lots of no's coming through, which I thought might be the case of a couple of yeses. Um, so Makaton is essentially um, speech with signs, so lots of using hands and signs um, to communicate with, with our learners. Um, they also use symbols which um, support the signs. Um, and it's just a way, like I've just said with AAC, to, to support and help people to, com to communicate. Um, I think this is really useful for online teaching and particularly with video. So I'm going to show you a little bit of Makaton. And I'm going to look silly now because I'm doing it on my own, but I hope that you're all going to join along with me at home. It's a shame I can't see you all because I'd love to see everybody joining in with this. So let's have wh wh whichever hand you uh, write with is your dominant hand in Makaton. So I'm right handed, so that would be my right hand. Aha, uh -huh, getting some comments about BSL. It's, yeah. It, it, it's not quite the same as that, but but similar approach. So can you hold up your dominant hand? So you've got it there. So for our hello, we're going to go from the left to the right hand side, or if you're left handed, right to the left, we're going to do our hello. So that's our hello and Makaton. I hope you're all doing it with me. Um, I am going to ask you how you are today. So I have my hands flat like this, and they come up my body and they go into a double thumbs up. That's, hello, how are you today? Hello, how are you? And then today is just a hands with the palms forward. So I hope everybody's doing this with me. We've got right hands, so you're gonna be doing the same as me. Hello, how are you today? And we could respond saying good, very good, thank you. And thank you is the one that I find myself doing a lot. I'll be shopping in the supermarket and I'll, I'll go to do that to the cashier. So it's quite hard when you're doing it every day. You get that habit built in. But that was just a little bit 
of Makaton for you to have a go with. Um, and I do think there's certain learners in my class who have got so much better with their signs and communicating. And often the learners that don't need the signs or, or to do that are the ones that are asking, can we can we learn more and can we use those and actually using them to, to communicate with those learners that do need them. So it's really lovely. Right, let's get back to the slides. Hopefully I can get them back up. Brilliant. Okay, so some ideas I thought I would share with you. So we have started doing uh, Makaton Mondays. So every Monday as a, a whole class, we will sit down and we will choose a, a video. If you haven't heard of Singing Hands, and again, if you've heard of Singing Hands, try, uh, type yes in the chat box. Singing Hands have some brilliant videos on YouTube of Makaton and lots of different songs and phrases and things that you can learn. So we do Makaton Mondays and we'll pick a theme and we learn as a class the signs for, for that week. So I think that'd be a really lovely thing to include in the ELT classroom as well. Um, English word of the day. This is when I was thinking, how can we adapt this for the ELT classroom? I think this would be a really nice thing to do, and I bet lots of you do it already with a, an English word of the day, is to then uh, take that word and get your students to learn um, and figure out what the Makaton sign is for that word. And there is pretty much a sign for everything. Some of them are really obvious, other ones um, not so much, but, but you can learn those together if you have learners that you think would benefit from that. And then of course, songs. Songs always go down well, especially if you're primary. So I'm a secondary teacher, but I bet there's lots of primary teachers uh, in the room. And I think they're, they're so lovely to, to do the songs with the Makaton signs and everybody can learn them together. Um, lots of you said that you've never heard of it before. So if you're interested and you'd like to find out more, um, do visit the Makaton charity online. They have lots of different videos and resources and things that you can do. And it might be that you don't want to learn all of the signs um, for Makaton, but you could start to incorporate some of those key ones into your classrooms um, throughout the week. So that was just a little bit on that. Um, visuals, as I said earlier, visuals are so, so important. And I think they really do support the content um, that we are sharing with our students. Um, so a big thing that we do constantly is our visual timetables. And hopefully you can see that one up on the board, um, on the screen from um, SEN uh, book from uh, Into the Classroom series by Oxford University Press. And I pulled this one out because it looks similar to the software that we use, which is called Boardmaker. But essentially you have those um, timetables just to support those learners throughout the day. Um, yeah, symbols, symbols, and more symbols. I think that even learners that you think might not need them, I think they will benefit from that hugely. Um, images, photographs, and lots of hand gestures and, and just being really clear with um, what you are teaching. But I do think those visual timetables, just to help with the learning throughout the day, if you do have learners that you think would benefit from that. Okay, again, I'm going to get you to type in the chat box. Have you heard of POD before? And it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm going to give it a go. Pragmatic Organization Dynamic Display. Has anybody heard of POD before? Because again, I certainly hadn't. Um, this is essentially a book or a device um, that uses a combination of symbols and words to support communication again. Um, it's mainly used with learners with complex communication needs. But again, I think it would be really useful for, for so many of our learners. Lots of no's coming through. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything about POD. And actually, I'm going to share a story with you because one of my learners from last year, um, the only way that she was able to communicate with us was um, using her eyes and using eye gaze. Um, so I worked really closely with one of my um, teaching assistants and we essentially created uh, a pod book, which was uh, sort of A4 size, and we tailored it to her needs. So we used four symbols on either corner and then encouraged her to use her eyes to choose the symbols to then communicate with us. And it was just such a lovely moment. I think it took us a while to get the right thing that would work for her. 
um, but it essentially has those pictures and then word underneath so that you can clearly see what it is that you're looking at. And I think this again could be adapted for ELT. You could have um, a word from the L1 or the first, learner's first language and underneath you could have the English word with those symbols just to keep reinforcing the, the vo vocab. Brilliant. Okay. I have been talking for a little while now and um, in my class, what we do a lot of the time is a little bit of a brain break. I wonder if you do any brain breaks with your students. Essentially, just to have a little break from learning, sometimes it can be really intense when you're trying to remember everything in the ELT classroom. Um, so we do all sorts of different stuff during our brain breaks. We like the dance freeze um, challenges, which are a good one, um, but we also like to do some mindfulness or some deep breathing we do all sorts of different stuff um so again i'm going to get you to join in with this unfortunately i can't see you i would love to be able to see you um we're going to do a little bit of seated yoga so make sure you're sat nice and i'm assuming most people are sat sat in their seats um with your feet both feet touching the ground and you're nice and grounded in your seat we are going to do a little bit of cosmic seated yoga and if you haven't heard of cosmic yoga you should also check that out online because we do enjoy that in my class right so we're going to do a little bit of yoga so seated yoga we're going to do a head to the side and then we're going to look the other side i'm doing this to make a point so hopefully you remember me doing my seated yoga but we basically do this for about three three to five minutes normally up and dancing uh, moving around i think just to shake ourselves out um but we're going to do just for a couple of minutes to make my point so i'm going to do a little bit of a head roll i hope you're doing it with me i can see lots of yeses and i can see i love yoga that's great okay we're going to pull our head to the side stretch it out obviously this is a bit of a calm one you can imagine in my classroom with my learners when we're getting up and dancing around and doing the freeze dance it can get a little bit busy but it's nice right let's roll our shoulders back and then we'll do up up up, up. so yeah just taking that time mainly getting up and out of the seat and just having um, a bit of a break from from the learning is just really good and i think you can get a sense of when that's going to work for your students or if you think that they might just need a little bit a little bit of a boost and a little bit of a move around so yeah see if you can incorporate some brain breaks into your next lesson and again have a look online there's so much out there but you'll get to learn the things that you and your class really enjoy brilliant i love all the comments everybody's enjoying that i'm glad <laughs> can't we just call it stretching it pretty much is isn't it but if you wanted to you could do a yoga session in in your class a short a shorter one okay so let's have a little look we've got the yoga out of the way let's do some practical ideas that hopefully you can then use and implement in your classrooms so i want you to have a little look at this image hmm what do you think it could be can you write in the chat box what you think this image might be we've gone from yoga to cryptic images it's all going on <laughs> let me know what you think it might be okay i've got somebody saying it might be a rhino a sheep lots of rhinos horns yep yeah, you're right you're not wrong there rhino ah okay yeah lots of rhinos that's great animals yep yeah. fangs rhinos a goat interesting a cow a yak Oh, there's some really good answers come through bull okay let's see because i think i have clocked that a couple of people may have figured out what it is let's have a look did you guess correctly i think it might be one of the elephants from oxford discover second edition units one to two with with some deers you're right so whoever was saying animals as well you were you're spot on um this is just a little bit of a starter activity that i like to do with some of my learners that just gets them guessing about what the topic might be that's coming up and i think there are lots of lovely ways that you could do this um you could send through 
symbols or pictures before the lesson starts as like clues. You could almost play the sound and, and try to get or, or muffle the sound so that it's not quite clear and get them to guess. Um, you could also get them to search some audio themselves and then send that across or play that while you're live online um, to see whether they've got the right animal. Um, I think there are lo loads of lovely things and ways that you can adapt materials. And that's just a little a little something to show you. Um, I have the uh, I have found that the special educational needs book from Into the Classroom series is my Bible. And I have referred to this for lots of stuff, which has been really supportive in both the ELT classroom and in, in my UK teaching. Um, so I've just picked out a couple of kind of activities that I thought I might talk through, and then we can think about how we might adapt those for our SEN learners. So definitions. Um, this is getting students to write definitions of keywords from a topic and then putting them on a class word wall. And I'm sure in our face-to-face -face and physical classroom, lots of us have word walls. Um, but this was possibly triggered an idea that you could either have a word, an interactive word wall on your learning platform, or you could use websites. I know we've looked at Trello or, or websites that are similar, where you could have almost the interactive conversations going on with students adding their definitions in. Um, and I think, yeah, I think there's lots of ways that you can have a play, a play with that to, to support the SEM learners as well. Um, my dictionary, students love dictionaries. We love the dictionaries. They, they, I think it's a nice way or a, a, a small activity for to, to encourage students to create their own glossaries or mini dictionaries of keywords. And again, I think there's lots of different ways that you could get them to do this. Introducing all those apps that we talked about earlier, um, potentially getting them maybe even to record themselves, like film themselves talking through their um, glossaries or their mini dictionaries. Um, and if they didn't feel comfortable doing that live in the classroom setup, perhaps they could go into smaller breakout rooms, which I'm sure you use, or you could figure out different ways for them to share, share those. Aha, so football cards. This was one that I spotted in the SEM book, and I thought it was quite an interesting one, um, where students hold up a coloured card to indicate whether they understand a point or not. And my immediate thought was, hmm, is that going to work? Is every learner going to feel com comfortable doing that in front of everyone else? So again, this is where you can differentiate. You could get somebody set up with their iPad with the symbol so they can choose um, one of the colours. Um, you could almost get them to take a little selfie of themselves holding up the, the card or, or the colour um, and email that across to you. Um, so I think there are lots of ways that you can do that that don't have to be on the forum with everybody watching. Um, what else have we got? Okay, this was quite an interesting one. Again, I think for, for something like this, where you've got word planes and you're asking students to draw a plane um, and think about some words that they could um, write behind that plane, you could easily set that up online as something that's interactive. You could get some sounds of the plane taking off. Um, you could send, again, some pictures and symbols and all sorts of stuff through. Um, and yeah, get them to even draw their own planes um, and hold those up to the screen and, and share those. Again, get them to practice their speech and, and saying those, those activities and those words um, to the class if they feel brave enough. Um, I think lots of the ideas that are in that SEM book you could easily adapt um, for your SEM learners and actually would probably make the session really engaging. Ha. So I bet lots of you have seen these before and I am a big, big fan of graded readers. Um, I just think they're wonderful, lovely visuals. You can get access to all the sounds. Um, you can listen to the audio version. Yeah, you can look at the pictures. There's lovely glossaries. Um, I am a big fan of graded readers and I think actually it, it, it is worth building regular reading time into your lessons using the graded readers. And it doesn't have to be just reading the book. We have so many resources at 
Oxford Uni Press that you can use with your learners and really get them to listen to the sounds and um, yeah, just just practice the, the speaking with those graded readers. I wonder how many of you already use them. And if you don't, definitely get researching. And I think there might be a link that we can share with you so you can browse the collections. Um, but they're just a really a valuable uh, resource to have in the ELT classroom, I think. And I do think they cater really well to our SEN learners. OK, this was another really nice activity that I pulled out, which is really simple and easy to do, but easily adaptable for, for different students and different levels. So micro writing again, let me know in the chat box if you've if you've uh, done any micro writing with your students. But I think this is a really lovely one, particularly with the students that don't feel so confident with their writing. So this is really short writing tasks where we're completing a sentence or writing a definition or making a list. Um, lots of you, I can see there's lots of yeses coming in, micro reading as well, brilliant. Right, so there's a mixture of answers for that one. I think this is a really nice task to do, and there are so many different ways that you can do this. Um, you should see some visuals on your screen. Um, so you could get learners to uh, write in the chat box, um, get them to put their short writing task in the chat box to you. Um, symbols, again, <laughs> I won't stop talking about the visuals and the symbols, get them to send those to go alongside their writing task. Um, this is an interesting one. How many of you use WhatsApp or messaging apps in the classroom and try to integrate them into part of your lesson? Because I think WhatsApping across a very short writing piece would be great as well and good practice for learners with technology. And the last one, email. I just think that it's lovely that you can get students to practice um, communicating electronically and there are lots of different ways that we can do that. What I quite like to do with my students, again, this is this is kind of like a quick, easy task at the beginning of the lesson. Um, but I have mocked up, you can see on your screen, um, an email template. And so I will set the learners a micro reading uh, writing task and then get them to fill out their email with that task. And it's just getting them thinking about, I think with my learners, getting them to um, learn all about technology and how to send and receive emails and how to reply. It just starts them thinking about that. And um, the other thing that I really like to do, um, again, incorporating those social media apps is get my students to either write a Facebook post or a tweet and stick to the word limit of the tweet to again have a go at, at, at those little mini writing tasks. And what the lovely thing is that you can tie them really easily to the activities that are happening in your lessons. So you'll see unit 1C from English File 4th edition, those little things that take minimal time to set up could be linked really nicely to, to the topics that you're looking at. And I bet lots of you have used English File before. OK, adapting materials. This is a tricky one. Um, do you differentiate for different needs and abilities? And how would you say that you do that? I'm going to give you a minute to write in the chat box what you think. How do you differentiate? And it is tricky. I've got a yes. I've got people. I'm going to give you a minute to write. Sometimes, yes, a lot, yes, yes. I think it is really tricky, and especially when you have learners that are at different levels in your class. Um, oh, great, lots of yeses coming through. Do you know, I think I still tr struggle with this, and it is a really tricky thing to master. I think it takes time to just to practice and get, get to know your learners. We, our current classes are set up, so it's based on age. So there's no um, ability grouping. And I think that's really interesting because then you can really target the learners um, and set them activities at the right level for them. Brilliant, lots of, okay, I've got a few no's, yeses. Brilliant, thank you so much for being so active in the chat box, it's lovely. 
Um, I do think that it is tricky to differentiate. And I've got a nice little quote here that I pulled from one of um, Oxford University Press's um, focus papers. Um, and I'm just going to read that out to you because I think it's something that a lot of us probably have struggled with. Um, I know about the need to differentiate in my class, but it takes a long time to adapt worksheets for different students. And I don't know how to do it effectively. And that was uh, George, a secondary teacher from Brazil. And I'm sure we've got lots of people from Brazil in, in the session right now. Um, I think it's a really interesting point, And I do think it is tricky to, to differentiate um, for each individual learner. But there are lots of different ways that we can do this. I know I've talked about differentiating by task, but you can also differentiate by content, by the things that are uh, included that you're serving to particular students. I think this is an interesting one that you can differentiate by student response. How are you going to get your learners to respond to you? And I think that's so, so important with our learners with additional needs. Like I said earlier, once we get to know the best way or preferred communication method for them, we can then figure out the best ways for them to feed back to us their answers. And I think that's really lovely. Um, you can differentiate by different um, activities. And then lastly, by assessment. And that's a whole other talk in itself, isn't it? But I think that there's lots of ways that you can differentiate in those final assessment points um, for each learner. This was another, yeah, so teaching mixed ability classes, again, one of the, the lovely pieces of research done by OUP. Um, differentiation does not always have to include adapting materials. It can involve handling materials flexibly and providing lots of options um, when setting up tasks and giving instructions. And hopefully I've been able to hint at that with some of those activities and practical tips that I've, I've given to you. Brilliant. So it's a bit of a tease, actually, because I went to have a look at teaching mixed ability classes, um, a focus on paper. And there were so, so many amazing activities and tasks in there. Um, so what I've done is pull out some of my favorites. Um, and I'm just giving you the title of those so that you go after this session and go and find out more and, and figure out what those might be. So different outputs take your pick, same text, different prompts, speak, pass, nominate, and challenge accepted. And I bet some of you are sitting there and nodding going, yep, yeah, I've probably done something similar to that, or I've, done, I've used that in my lesson before. Um, but do, do make the most of those um, focus and position papers. They have some really great ideas in them. And it's not all just research. There are lots of practical hands-on tips and tricks that you can use. Okay. Lastly, we're on to developing learner autonomy or learner agency. I think this is a key one at the moment. There are lots of discussions happening around this. Again, I think it's really tricky to master. Um, but the, the key things that I've pulled out are around that growth mindset. Students need to believe that they've got the skills um, to develop and to learn effectively. And I think the teacher can instill that as well within the student. I think that, that our learners need to be feel like they're in control of their learning and they have ownership over what they're learning and when and how, which is what we've been, been talking about today, um, and that ability to learn and improve so that they know the next steps and that they can see that progression. Um, and I've added that lovely quote from Sarah, um, just that learners need to believe that they can make a difference to their learning. I think I said it earlier about our approaches being student centred, but I do think it's really important to give learners some ownership um, and, yeah, and, and, and for them to have a say in what they're going to learn as well. I think it's tricky to, to get that balance. But yes, I'm, I'm getting lots of agrees in the chat box as well. And so with learner agency, you can see that lovely visual there. Um, there's so many things that impact our learners and we know best, don't we, that there are so many things that might be out of our control um, with, with our learners. But I think it's important for us as teachers to um, keep referring to and ensuring that learners have that sense of ownership and control of their learning and that they are active authors in their learning rather than 
passive recipients. Um, I think that's really, really important. I know, I'm sure all of you are constantly thinking about that, but it's just taking that time, certainly for our learners with those additional needs, just to make sure that they feel they have control over their learning. Brilliant. I think that might be towards the end of the talk. I just wanted to flag again, all the resources and, and lots of the, the um, papers that I've mentioned throughout this talk are available. So please go and, and have a look at those. I specifically mentioned um, managing online learning and teaching mixed ability focus papers. And as I said, my Bible for SEN um, by Mari Delaney in Into the Classroom series. There should be some links that you've got there so you can you can grab those. I'm sure they'll be in in the pack at the end of the talk. And again, um, learner agency and inclusive practices um, position papers. So many good um, nuggets of information and so many good practical tips. You might see a QR code that you might be able to scan for those on the screen. Um, but please do make sure you go and um, download all of the uh, amazing resources that are out there from, from Oxford University Press. Um, and good luck. I hope that, that some of those um, activities and tips and things that I've talked about today, really hope that you can go ahead and try, try all those, use them in your classrooms. Thank you so, so much for listening to me and thank you for joining and for being so active in the chat box. It's been really lovely um, discussing and having responses from you. Um, if there's any questions, uh, do let me know. And I'm just going to have a look because I'm sure that our fantastic team of moderators have popped some in for me to have a look at as well. Yep, there's a fair few in there, Leanne. If you click on Q&A, um, <clears throat> you will see them. You possibly need to scroll down a bit because there are quite a lot of questions. Wow. And you have approximately 10 minutes to answer them. If you need any help, then just let me know. OK, brilliant. Thank you so much. Guys, thank you for sending so many questions in as well. It's lovely to see. I'm going to see if I can pick some out and answer those here. Oh, OK. So what do you mean with onboarding students? And that was when I was talking about all those tools um, and the technology that's available. Essentially, making sure that learners understand the steps. So if it is something that they've got a login for or they need to access, that you've made that accessible to them in a way that they learn so for example if it was my learner with an ipad who had those symbols and that activated voice app i could use his ipad and find the symbols to clearly show him how he needed to use this new piece of technology um i think yeah onboarding is essentially just making sure that learners know exactly what they're doing when they use that that tool or that piece of technology i hope that's answered that question um here we go let's have a look at some other questions ah interesting yeah this is an interesting one so how many students do you usually have in one group so interestingly and i'm sure you have all sorts of different numbers of, of learners in your class i've got nine in my class which is lovely because it's meant that i can really get to know students and tailor the learning to them i know that it's not quite the, the case sometimes and we have huge numbers in our elt classrooms don't we um, but I do think there's still ways to differentiate and just to make sure that you you are targeting learners at the right level. Um, here we go. Let's have a little look. Ah. Got some questions about Makaton. Um, where to learn more about Makaton? So if you can have a little Google form, the Makaton charity. They do lots of really good videos and you can actually sign up to courses. So I've done level one, level two. I think it goes all the way up to level five. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to learn out, learn more about Macton, do have a look online. There's a few come through about that. Is is Macton use universal? Yeah, I think it's used all around the world. It is different to BSL. It's not its own language. It's used as a way to support communication. So it's slightly different because there's a few that are coming through about that are there any handouts yes we'll have lots of handouts in, in an email after the session so we can share those with you oh do you think it's a good idea to teach the alphabet in sign language definitely i think it's a nice way actually for learners to share their names um, with each other i definitely think that 
there's lots of songs out there as well that can help with that but it's just that that lovely way to be able to introduce yourself in English clearly but then it would be great wouldn't it to be able to do that with, with the sign language too um here we go what are some strategies to promote inclusion on online in online classes I think that's a really good one I think that 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 all depends on your learners um but i think there's certain ways of making sure that everybody is included and hopefully some of the stuff that i've touched upon in my sessions um will have answered that um but i think it's getting to know those learners and how they learn to make sure that they're participating and they're able to participate whether that's through separate activities in breakout rooms whether it's a uh, creating something that they share so they video themselves or I think there are lots of different ways to make sure that everybody's included on online classes and I think yeah just figuring out the ways that that your learners prefer to answer questions and interact because there's nothing worse than being put on the spot and and, and feeling nervous in that in that forum or in front of peers no what other questions have we got Do you consider English for speakers of other languages in the same category with special educational needs? If yes, why? If not, why? So I, I think that lots of our um, ELT learners have those additional needs. And I think that it's really about su supporting those. I would say that I guess SEN is not, it shouldn't be seen as a separate, I, I, an entity and that it should be thought about across all our um, classes and across all of, all of, of our lessons. So I wouldn't see them as separate. I'd kind of see them as, yeah, ELT, um, but in the background, what kind of what is going on with our SEN learners? Well, this is an interesting one. So I want to know what can I do when my session is very limited in time while I cater for all learners types? I think this is a real struggle, isn't it? Because a lot of the time our lessons can be like 45 minutes to an hour and you're kind of thinking, how am I going to make sure that everybody is, is engaging in the activities and able to complete them in that time? What I tend to do in my class is I've kind of grouped learners based on abilities. So I have nine learners and then I'll have kind of three separate stations almost for, for the groups and I'll have three learners in each group and um, they're roughly at the same sort of level so then I can create um, resources and activities that cater for them in some cases like in my lower class I would try to differentiate even more and, and get them to do kind of hands-on um, different tasks but it it makes it easier if you can group. And again, I think that you probably naturally do that when you get to know your learners, um, but just, yeah, getting them into, into groups for, for that time. Do you want to take one more question, Leah? Of course, let me have a little look. Ah, oh. oh, that's a really interesting one. How do you handle sensory overload? And this is something that I haven't really touched on. I guess the brain break was a little bit of a, a break for those that might have sensory overload. We do lots of stuff at our school and it's amazing for that. Um, but I would say, just just moving away from, from the learning for a second, we have um, sensory blankets, we have cushions that you can um, activate with a switch. Um, we have all sorts of different like balls, jiggly things that the students can play with. Um, I've just got a giant medicine ball that um, they can have a little bounce on. And sometimes it's just get, stepping out of the classroom for a minute because it can be really noisy and really bright. And the, the same with online learning, staring at the screen. Um, so yeah, I think there are lots of different things that you can do face-to-face -face and online. And I would say, have a little look and do some more research. Don't forget to check out the SEM book because there are lots of tips for that um, in that book, Into the Classroom series. Brilliant. Brilliant. Can I ask you to start to wrap up? Yeah, great. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for all your lots of interesting questions and comments throughout. It's been really lovely talking to you today. Um, hopefully you've
taken away some um, key things from that, that talk and I hope that you will use them all in your lessons. Thank you so much and have a lovely rest of the day or yeah, evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Le uh, Leanne. I, I hope that you uh, have had a chance to look in the chat box and see how many people are thanking you and telling you you have amazing you. ideas. Uh, I thought that was a, a rather super talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, everybody. <laughs>